in Cleveland. Um, we hit it off great. It was lovely, a lovely year. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Judy. How you doing? Good. Sun's out in Minnesota, so I'm happy. It's been rainy all week. That's awesome. Yay, Gabrielle. We've got an infinity loop in the in the room. I love that. Hey. Oh, there I am. A Mobius Hi. loop. Sorry. Yeah. Nice to see you all. Yeah. This is great. Bentley, Hank. This is great. Let's wait another minute for a couple more people to show up, and then we can dive into a really quick round of check-ins. Um, in the meantime, if you want to use the chat just to put a word in that has been bouncing around in your head lately, just any it could be about anything, just a word. Oh, that's a good word. See, we're on the we're on to a theme already. <laughs> <laughs> that is weird. I have to imbibe with systems thinking. Yeah, that, that works. Sleep is good. Yeah, yeah. It's early on the left coast here, so up early. Yeah. A whole new world. Yeah. It's, it's weird. Like, I think there's an interesting conversation to be had in OGM about, about what role we might play in helping everybody sort their way to better solutions for all the things that are broken. I think uh, school is a great one <laughs> as, as a now, you know, again, round two, going to have two girls at home and figuring that out and um, figuring out it in, as an inclusive community, not as micropods of wealthy families. That was interesting, wasn't it? Yeah. That's a, so important. We're talking about that here in Minnesota, too, and trying to develop sort of um, then gritty groups of learning and yep. ways for children to interact with other children, occasionally with an adult in the room and all, all that kind of stuff. I hope it's gonna turn out to be a rejuvenation of real technology change. Well, we're doing summer mystery history with a group of between three and five kids, depending on who shows up, and me and one sweet teacher who is a friend of a friend who shows up to try and realign their sense of how to interact with each other and learn while having fun. Awesome. And, uh, Sounds like a great objective. So if you ever want to join a mystery history, we have a, uh, we're skipping next week because everybody's not available, but you can join the one about Cleopatra in two weeks. That sounds good. That's awesome. So, you know, send me an email if you or your kid wants to join and I'll add you to the list. It's very unstructured. Let me just. <laughs> I've never played mystery history. I haven't either. Nancy, could you just send out your email? Because I'm not sure where sure. I would find it. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. And does, so it's just an unstructured sort of conversation. So the kids could teach whatever. The kids pick a theme. Uh, we've started putting together for the Hope Diamond, we did a mural timeline and they researched and they had to put their sources in there. And then we usually had a, you know, is it a curse or is it not a curse? Am I on team curse or team non curse? And they gave their ideas and brainstormed. Um, nice. This week it's on the uses of microfiber. Sweet. And the next one's going to be on Cleopatra. <coughs> wow. All girls, so they're, they're also really interested in, you know, interesting yeah. female figures. But we have a meeting on Monday to kick it off and then a meeting on Thursday to wrap it up. That is awesome. Um, let us go around. Um, I'm going to send, I'm going to put a link to my brain that uh, might be good for you or them or whatever as a, if, if, they're, if they're interested. Um, there we go. Paste the link. Uh, women who should be on the currency. Hmm. Um, <laughs> oh, that'll be a good one for them. I'm going to forward this to uh, her yeah. right now. There's also, th there's also a thought in my brain called badass women, but I think that might be like inappropriate, but, but it's not. Gonna... That, that just sounds like we've got a bad ass. That doesn't sound good at all. I have a very fine ass. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. You know, words are so problematic. 
<clears throat> anyway, let's do a real quick go around just, uh, just to check in and then we can dive into our topic. I, I'm sitting here in not that sunny Portland. It's a little overcast. Uh, weather's really nice right now, the, you know, perfect going out, but we're supposed to hit some highs in a couple of days that will be, will tell us that it's actually sort of summer. Um, Portland is apparently a lively protest. We haven't gone out into them yet, but we're about to um, and see what's up because uh, bad things are happening. Uh, yeah, exactly. Be careful. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to be careful sort of as we approach things. Uh, also, if I can ask everybody to mute unless you're checking in, that'll help us with echoey, echoey stuff like that. And I'm just going to go across how I see my, uh, my grid view here. So how about Nancy, Hank, Anthony? Uh, you, if you'll check in, yeah, just to check in and you're muted. There. I'm going to do a mind check in. Awesome. Really? Um, Over to Hank. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, just uh, going well. That's that's the check-in that I'll give today. Sounds great. Thanks, Anthony. In Cleveland. I'm sorry. What are you asking about, Jerry? Just checking in. Where 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 are you in the world, and how are things with you this day? I'm retired and developing, uh, my, my strength is in integrate, it's looking at systems thinking from an integrated conceptual standpoint. That's kind of a missing element in it. It's, it's widely disparate concepts that nobody can tie together. So uh, when my retirement, I'm developing, uh, it used to be something called STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math for teaching kids. I was developing a STEM program, which is now on hold, <laughs> uh, to teach uh, using a simple business case a one person operation, it ties together all the system thinking concepts. And that's the overall framework in which you, you talk about mind maps where we tie together all the different things with an overall framework that presents that, that ties, uh, try, trying to teach kids integrated systems thinking. I get tongue tied, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's great. And, um, and no reason why your project needs to come to a halt because lockdown and because schools are in jeopardy, that would be really interesting to put in the world in some other way, perhaps. So yeah, there's blogs and there's websites, I realize, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that's super, super interesting. We may, uh, you might find some more interested parties in that, uh, in that here. Then let's go uh, Kurt, Pete, Gabrielle. We are uh, not here. Sorry about that. I was on, I was on mute. <laughs> yep. Um, Kurt, uh, I am currently in Jersey City. Things are calm, except for the fact that we had a blinding lightning storm last night. And the statue. Your audio and your video are cranky on us. Oh, shoot. Kurt, we, the, the last thing around was that you had a lightning 20 plus off my video for a second. Yeah, hold on. Thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, I was just saying that um, I, uh, I am a serial entrepreneur, um, been in this for the past 20 years, and um, in, on the tech side of things, and most recently I've been working on, um, uh, well, uh, I've been working on helping um, minority and women founders start companies. Um, that plus a couple of other um, uh, big ideas, uh, like trying to figure out a metric, a universal metric for impact, for how we define impact. Um, and some small <laughs> ideas, like uh, launching, I just launched a, um, a virtual summer camp for kids. Uh, three mm, weeks ago, fabulous. So. Awesome. Yeah. That's totally cool. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks for joining us. Um, Pete, then Gabrielle, then Judy. Uh, hi. Um, in beautiful San Diego, it's going to be a gorgeous day today, like usually. Um, I'm thinking about uh, uh, group federation, federating groups, and uh, decentralized directories um, of people and things. Um, Matt and I had a great call uh, together uh, earlier this week talking about all kinds of cool stuff. So I'm still buzzing a little bit about that, but um, need to write more, I guess. So want to jump into the, the email a little bit more. That's great. Thank you. Gabrielle? Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm coming to you from Porto, northern Portugal, where it's been gorgeous today. It's a bit foggy, which is strange. And there are actually a lot of Portlandians. There's a whole Portland's coming to Porto group, which a friend started. And so all the Americans at lunch today were like, 
glad we're in Portugal. It's kind of, yeah, a great place to do the pandemic. And what am I thinking about today? I'm thinking about how I can get my book actually written. I write a huge amount of stuff and actually trying to get it done. I tell people how to do this in real life, but getting it done myself, that's my, <laughs> this week's challenge. I love that. And one of the things that's keeping me from doing a task like that is that I much prefer woven things than linear text. And to me, the multimedia woven transmedia experience is, is like the thing I want to manifest. And a book would be a snapshot of a point in time of that. And it's kind of a necessary artifact in today's world. Um, and I can't, can't find the time for the snapshot, I think, as, as is happening to you. Um, and Judy, good, you're just, just stepping back yeah, down. I was just grabbing a tablet. Judy, um, then, then Ken, then Charles, then Hadi. Uh, Judy, I'm in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Gorgeous, sunny day with sky that's blue, which we've been mostly gray for a week, so that's wonderful. Um, I've been working with an arts group that I'm on the board for with uh, social consciousness and how to bring art and creativity to children in shutdown. And fascinating to try to figure out the group dynamics of it and to also try to engage the younger cohort in art. That's fabulous. Thank you, Ken. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you might be. Um, I'm Ken Homer. I'm in San Rafael, California, where the marine layer is in. It's a pretty cool morning out here, but I'm still outside because I try to live outside as much as I can in the summertime. Um, I, right now, I'm thinking, I saw an amazing movie last night, and it's kind of a topical thing. I'm thinking, uh, the movie we saw was called The Last Black Man in San Francisco, which I highly recommend. Um, visually, everything about this film is is incredible. It just, it works on so many levels. And... Um, you know, watching the Black Lives Matter protests and, you know, I've been reading a lot about um, white fragility and I just, uh, I've got an audible account because I'm standing so much in lines these days. So I've been listening to books and I just listened to James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time and my mind is really like, oh my God, this is just, he nails so many things, it's so powerful. So I'm in kind of a, a deconstructing my, my self phase around how is, my participation in racist culture showing up you know how can i be much more aware of what's going on and um and uh i don't know there's something now about political correctness of not saying you're an ally i mean i've always considered myself to be an ally well for several years anyway um but i, I just i want to become more effective in this conversation so i'm in a uh, the, the opening end of the funnel with all kinds of things pouring in. And um, so just if you want something really interesting, and I also watched 13th last week. So um, I'm just trying to educate myself on what's going on before I try to make any moves. And uh, so that's one of the things that's poured in. And, and I'm so impressed with this film. It's just stayed with me all night. I, I woke up wow. thinking about it and I, I'm still in my mind. So uh, check that out. Thank you. And what, one of the most important things I think OGM, this group could do, is work on that topic and figure out how to be useful, how to be helpful. Um, and in, in particular, how to change racists' minds or how to soften their minds enough that they might contemplate the possibility of changing their minds or whatever the, whatever the approach is, exactly. Thank you. Um, Charles, Hadi, then Lauren. Hey, everyone. Hey. Greetings from Zurich, Switzerland. Um, we've been having a summer, summery weather, sort of threatening rain, clouds, not much rain, just a bit stuffy, but, but pleasant. Um, it's also a decent place to do the pandemic, as that's an interesting phrase, do the pandemic. Um, but uh, without going into all that, I'm, I'm buzzing from a call late last night uh, with Tom Atley, Rosa Subitzaretta, a Kalia identity woman, Andy Pace uh, talking about polis, but actually then we kind of really went into facilitation, dynamic facilitation. And um, after all of that, the, the takeaway is, is we have uh, still a kind of invitation that Tom does not want to organize, but we have his uh, still new unpublished models of, of um, collective sense making, sort of ecosystem of collective sense making. And, and there's um, 
kind of clear specific ways that he sees Polis and other tools fitting into different parts of the model. We didn't actually look at the visuals last night, but I think that's fascinating and it's just, it, it could either just not happen and get kind of swept in the winds or we could, we, whoever could come in and do something. Um, I also had a wonderful call with Lauren Nignon, who's here um, just earlier, about a bunch of new Kiko Lab goodies, which uh, maybe she'll mention, but we're, we're starting a new Monday call thing. Um, and I think that's enough for me for now. Thanks. Glad to be here. That's awesome, Charles. And I'm very curious about the Tom Atley effort you just talked about. Um, so we'll bring that back into the conversation. Hari, Lauren, then Bentley. Um, hi guys, Hari from Bangalore in South India. Good to see all of you and uh, really happy to be on this call. So my current state of mind is very confused, uh, but I am trying to be present with it because I think it's just part of the uh, process of, uh, you know, like uh, figuring out what to do next uh, because I'm kind of going through a personal pivot and the immediate stuff, which is, kind of confusing me is how to get funding for sustainability and sustainable development in this context, which we're in right now. Uh, and what's interesting is that uh, it's actually, you know, getting funding for that kind of stuff has been really hard for all the jobs I've worked in. And uh, I actually want to study how to finance the transition to a sustainable society as a thing in itself, because it's not just about getting the money. It's about changing the way the system works uh, from many different angles. And, I've been reading uh, Al Gore's work, for example, where he uh, has a new way of uh, thinking about these things. And, uh, you know, I've also been reading some. So so that's where I am, you know, like uh, just uh, about to, yeah, yeah, that's me. Thank you, Harry, that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, uh, Lauren, Bentley, then Jay. And Lauren, if, if, if you can check in on how last Monday's call went and what's up with that too. Super happy with it, and uh, I think it will wind up being bananas. And um, uh, I'm gonna be kind of increasing the kind of diversity and um, stuff like that. So uh, let me just give you a background for the people who aren't here. So I've started a call that kind of feeds into OGM, where we're working on practical collective intelligence, where we just kind of throw down in. Um, see if we can find out like practical methodology, low tech that we can actually um, that, you know, we basically build frameworks that people can make fancier with technology. And so um, we're starting. It, so we're doing a weekly call on Mondays at uh, 9 p.m. Uh, CET, which is 3 p.m. Eastern time for the States. And we're doing kind of relevant social political discussions for the next month. It's going to be race. And um, so getting together a super diverse group of people to talk about memes and how we can develop powerful memes and deliver them. And what's the kind of uh, framework for doing so in the methodology. Um, the so it's combining kind of collective intelligence with uh, social issues. And so, yeah, we're bringing up some stuff. It should be, it's, it's yeah, it's already super interesting. <laughs> Sounds like it. Sounds like it, thank you. Um, anything else you wanna check in with? We're good? Okay, Any, anything else? Good. Um, Bentley, Jay, Neil, then Matt. I'm Bentley. Um... I'm really tired today, so I might actually turn off my video in case I want to lay my head down. Don't want you to think I've passed out. Um, I'm excited to work on three projects uh, right now. I, I, my job right now is just prototyping um, ideas to save the world. So doing one on mass agreement, doing one on interweaving uh, text with images and, uh, and auxiliary information. Uh, large texts like books and multiple book sets. And then um, the third project is uh, helping people get feedback on short snippets of text, um, collaborating on that. Um, like, you know, a response I might give to this person on Facebook or stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so interested to see what we'll do today. 
Cool. Uh, I've not been a part of the, I think it's called the MCO community, the photo community online. Um, but I understand it's really useful in improving people's photography, just by analogy. Um, and there might be some interesting dynamics uh, to learn from that. And of course, many other communities that do these kinds of things. Cool. Um, Jay. Hi, everybody. My name is Jay Golden. I'm calling in from uh, Ashland, Oregon, where it's been super hot in the day, but nicely in the morning, it's kind of cool. Um, so I'm appreciating that. Uh, I think it, it's sometimes hard to track all the different pieces, but I think the core of what I'm doing is uh, as a storytelling coach and storyteller out in the world is, is trying to help people to kind of gather their lives and the insights of their lives based on um, those 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 critical essential stories that are that illuminate our purpose and who we are in the world and working with that in a kind of bottom up way to cultivate a bottom up mythology so one that starts with our individual lives and builds up into something that's kind of more distilled that illuminates our lives but also connects us with other people that are on similar paths of, of change and transformation. And how does that inform greater stories that can guide us into a, a viable future that we co-create? So I'd say that's kind of the, that, that brings me to the meta, but the, uh, the essence is how do stories work? What do we mean by story? Um, how do they inform change on our individual lives and collective? That is awesome. And I'll point out that OGM feels very geeky probably because there's lots of talk of tools and visualizations and a lot of its stimulus comes from my use of the brain for 22 years and wanting to move to some other distributed collective intelligence kind of platform. And yet, and yet a huge piece of what needs to happen here is about stories, has little to do with technology, is about human interaction, is about bridging the cultural divide, is about trust and vulnerability and people sort of softening up and getting together and trying to figure out how to make our world better. <clears throat> so, so that conversation is actually really essential and I wanna figure out how to, how to nourish it uh, and where to go. Uh, Neil, then Matt, and then we're out of the check-in round. Thanks, Jay. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, this is only my second time here. Forgive me for not having caught up with emails and things. Um, personally, I probably know best in the group, although I do know a few from Facebook posts is Ken Homer, who we have regular pun sparring matches. Um, I moved from Australia that was on fire to Belgium in January. Um, I currently am watering about 20 rows of vegetables on a small uh, garden from, for about an hour and a half every evening. So I know how dry it is in Belgium when it, when it shouldn't be. Um, the groundwater tables are depleting, the rainfall isn't coming, and we've got a 40-year-old organic vegetable garden here. Nobody else on the street has one, and I know how hard it is to keep this one alive. Um, I'm in the process of setting up a, an initiative business, for want of a better word, called And Now What, which is looking at transdisciplinary integration, weaving, using my uh, poetry and my pictures as one of the engagement mechanisms for vertical, you know, who's conscious enough to see this stuff for the beauty, goodness and truth in it. And then how do we then work with my friend uh, and partner now, Anne, who is a, a psychologist. And we're looking at how do we hold space for grief, hold space for change, transformative change, vulnerability, authenticity, trust, uh, and now what is the name of the initiative. So I'm here today uh, feeling very privileged uh, to be white, living on a farm in a beautiful place at this time, gorgeous weather. I'm also feeling very, very worried for all those people that aren't and where they're at. And my heart is out to those in America having to put up with the crap you guys are going through at the moment, so. Thank you very much. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, Matt, and then did I forget anybody? But Matt, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, as, as Peter mentioned, I've been um, having a bunch of one-on-ones with various people on these calls just to get to know folks better. Um, so that's been really delightful. Um, I'm, uh, from an OGM standpoint, I'm working with Andres and uh, a wonderful young designer on 
his team and a designer on our team to think about uh, how to brand OGM. Um, and branding is really not really what's important here. It's just, um, it's just trying to, I know there was a logo put out on the boards and, and those sorts of things. And what we've really come up with is this idea that we're all living in Plato's cave in a kind of a white dome. Um, and what we want to do is to cut a window into that that sort of entices people to, to come to the other side. And so that's kind of where we're going with um, some of the design aesthetics there. So expect to see more um, on that in the coming weeks. And then the other thing that may connect to some of the things that people are talking about, um, you know, Jay, uh, maybe what you're talking about and, and Neil, some of the things that you mentioned is I'm working with a really good friend of mine um, who is uh, the CEO of one of the largest financial services company in Canada. Um, and um, he's just recently, and please sort of keep this, you know, again, inside of this, uh, this wonderful bubble that we've created, but he's um, suffering from early onset Alzheimer's and has invited me into um, a process to work with him on some story threading, not only about his own life and who he is and who he's become, um, but also what he has participated in in terms of crafting what is the modern financial services system and starting to document maybe his dreams and imagination for what it could become um, um, as, a, as a form of legacy making. So um, I'd be interested in collaborating with some people to think about how we approach a situation like that, not just for his uh, benefit, but also as a way of capturing um, and creating narrative that can be um, world changing. So um, Jay, expect me to follow up. Neil, expect me to follow up um, after this um, on that project. Very cool. Thanks, Matt. Um, did we miss anybody? I think we got everybody on the check-in. Um, there are a couple of interesting kind of uh, issues that are bubbling up on the list and the list traffic is leading to one issue, um, which is like, how do we manage list traffic, right? And uh, how do we not overwhelm? How do we not scare people away? Uh, how do we uh, have fruitful discussions and where do they go? And, my, and then how many places are we talking in and so forth? Because uh, Charles has nicely started a telegram group, uh, but I'm not sure wh you know, what, the, what the heart of that discussion is relative to this discussion and how they all fit. And it would be really nice to, and I'm, I'm revamping the, the very simple OGM website to include Andres's graphic uh, as, a, as a banner. Um, and would love to have a page there that's sort of a table of contents <clears throat> or a directory to where the conversations are. Because my instinct on this is a little bit that when, when a topic, when a conversation gets really frothy and gets really interesting, to find a place for it, to basically say, where should this conversation be held? Can, does someone else want to host it? Should it be held on Reddit or uh, Stack Exchange or some, if it's, if it's a techie, techie geek, geeky conversation, should it head toward a platform like that um, or, uh, or, or whatever? And then can we have a common place where we have not just sort of pointers to those conversations, but ideally <clears throat> a status at a glance of what is the hot topic right now? What have we just done? A little bit of a history of the conversation so that we can find our way and weave our way across these conversations because having if, if the open global mind covers lots and lots of things it covers lots of topics and lots of disciplines and lots of creative things um, and if we hold all those conversations on the same mailing list we're all going to like freak out because we'll never get to the end of our of our of our email every day <clears throat> and uh, when when lockdown started, it feels to me I don't have I didn't track numbers, but it feels to me like my email volume just doubled, and it also feels like a lot of it was important and interesting. Um, I'm having a I'm having in lockdown and in pandemic and in uh, in what I'm calling meltdown, which is sort of lockdown plus um, everything else happening, um, an experience that was similar to the run up to the Iraq War, where until the day Bush launched the war, there was this efflorescence of fabulous essays of people really like thinking deeply about what is a just war and the justifications for war and all that and and I just I, I was just riveted by the the stream of things going by and then the day the war happened that went away mm. that that whole flow of brilliance just went away and suddenly we were at war and Bush was a wartime president and everything kind of changed and it's as if we stopped tending that garden right 
Um, so, so now we're in a similar moment, except we're way down the shoots on the intertubes and what the intertubes can do for good and bad, because now I think we're much more awakened to the idea that this is like a stalker economy and that some of the platforms are harming us as much as they're helping us. <clears throat> but I think we have an opportunity to model how, as like many of you said in your check-ins, how to make the world better um, by harnessing all this stuff. Uh, so I think that there's, there's that kind of piece. And, and one of the things that OGM can do here is sort of model it and then build out the parts that are missing if there's, if there's aspects that we think are missing. So let me just go quiet for a second. That, that's kind of, that's a piece of my own approach to how can we sort of um, hold different conversations well uh, and uh, blend them in a way that's kind of, kind of functional and fruitful. And uh, all additional uh, <clears throat> ideas are completely welcome. Judy. Uh, you need to mute, uh, unmute yourself because we are not hearing you. I, th I thought you were reaching for your mute button. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm interested in, in how we harness the collective intelligence notion in a multi-generational way and maybe tie it in with something that Susan said in another call about seven generation thinking of Native Americans and how that could influence all of our stories and all of the groups that we form so that we might be able to get a whole cobweb of intersocial discourse going with people in different disparate age groups, but also across the age group boundaries to try to lead toward this generational thought change that we've talked about before. And just a tiny idea on the front, <clears throat> Matt talked about a friend of his who's got early onset Alzheimer's and how we might build a legacy for him. <clears throat> Schools are broken, education is kind of broken. One really interesting thing kids could do if directed toward the tools and the methods to do it a little bit is talk to their elders and download their stories and, in, and investigate their histories <clears throat> and go piece together the, the, the larger stories of what these are and then riff on them with their elders in ways that, that sort of join them on different kinds of, of crafts or arts or, or whatever else. I think that yeah. eight, eight things that were said during our check-in would fit really, really nicely into what, how kids and, and, you know, and it's really funny when you skip a generation because you know, grandkids and grandparents are like a tight bond and the grandparents don't feel like they're responsible for the grandkids all the time. And the grandkids are like, this is not the older person that's always telling me no. So there's, a, there's like a, a, special, a special relationship there. Do you want to add to that, Judy? Well, I just wanted to add that the, the connection of that to blue zones, because all of the blue zones have a multi-generational capacity that the typical current society doesn't have. And with the virtual connection, blue zone. all the families are, blue, blue zones, zones are the high longevity zones, you know, where they've studied cultures where people typically like, live to 110. Okinawa is a blue zone, et cetera. I'll, I'll put there's, there's, there's some places on the West Coast too. Um, but it all has to do with, multi-generational valuation in a sense of the people and the connectivity that evolves from that. And I think we could really do something powerful with that in an internet Zoom zone because now all the grandparents are talking to all of their kids with Zoom and were even before the pandemic, they're just doing it more frequently now. And so there's a huge opportunity for multi-generational impact. Other thoughts on, on the same topic? Just a quick one. I'm um, just picking up on that point that the respect that parents, sorry, the respect that children have for their parents is increased when they see their peers respecting their parents. And so the capacity to demonstrate through wit or humor or poetry or pictures or something cool to the, the kids that may be rebelling within the household uh, can be shifted when they see that others of their own generation get it. So I'd be keen to see how we can bring, uh, and this is why I like Ken's stuff around the puns. You know, these are multi-generational, transdisciplinary, you know, uh, crazy stuff. And I play with that. And when you can play with that and show uh, your acuity with that, you, you do get some respect in the same way that rap shifted poetry. That, um, so I think that there's some really good opportunities here if we can work out how do we bring young people into a group like this to allow them to see the great stuff we're trying to do, which then generates the respect to go back around the cycle. Because I've got young people in Australia in their 20s who are probably better philosophical thinkers and certainly 50 years ahead of me at their age in terms of consciousness who are crying out for elders and I had to leave. And so uh, how do we create this, uh, 
multidimensional web of people that have the capacity to hold space and the experience to know what not to do and those coming through with the new enthusiasm ready to take the reins if they could avoid making the same mistakes if they had somebody that they trusted to tell them don't do it that way <laughs> and just to elaborate on what i was saying a moment ago the obvious path is sort of like story core is like hey grandpa grandma tell your story and we'll record it and maybe do something on top of that and that's totally like golden but there's an opportunity here to break a lot of taboos like many, many, many families when lots of parts of the family get together have this let's not talk politics and religion at the table kind of policy. They're, they're busy avoiding really important issues in our lives. And I think there's an opportunity here to sort of download, debrief, listen gently and dive into belief systems and where did we get this and why are we, wait, what? And kids ask the most brutal questions like kids don't have their filters installed yet that's what socialization does and it breaks our, our actual common sense a lot um, so I think that process might be super interesting and might be generative for people shifting their points of view and so forth Hari um, thanks uh, I'm just reminded of something one of my friends uh, told me about and she's in media she's in Sweden uh, so uh, maybe it's already factored in for what you're You've, we've been discussing, but uh, she said there's a way to make, uh, you know, communication and uh, discourse instead of making it like linear, like an arrow to make it into a circle. And she said, if, you know, you, you have a community which is generating content or generating uh, stories and then consuming it uh, themselves and then generating more insights and so on and so forth. And uh, you could think of it as a kind of a living lab maybe, but that's just one way of looking at it. And the basic idea is that uh, things start flowing in circles and uh, you can do this with new media and with, uh, you know, with, with apps and things like that. So I just thought I'd share that. Thank you. E even just the notion of circles is really cool. Jay? Yeah, so I've been dreaming up this idea of kind of, there's two paths. One is the, the person that is facing a challenge and a kind of organic method of drawing out what that challenge is. And then the other hand is the people that have experienced and kind of gone through the challenge. And they're delivered in particular in stories that are intended to be retained and retold, uh, or at least, you know, there's a little shaping support, but that could be on the side. But I think there's a vast, such a vast well of knowledge. And there's a question of how do you create an invitation for it you know, what's the gathering mechanism or refinement mechanism and what's the delivery mechanism. But I think it's kind of a perfect collaborative kind of wisdom tool. It'd be fun to work on. Absolutely. Uh, Neil? Just adding to that, um, my understanding of indigenous stories in Australia and the song lines, these are deeply ingrained story trails through real natural ecological systems. Uh, that they've been walking for 65 to 45,000 years, depending on where you want to draw the line. Um, when they talk and educate, they talk in systems context. And the closest I can imagine is the, the minister in a church coming in and you know, speaking to a verse in the Bible that speaks to something that happened politically that week. Um, in this case, they're walking through a system, they're watching it in real time, they're seeing the current climate or the current uh, you know, change in season. They're describing stories that are generations old and they make sense because they're actually in the sense making mode and they're actually in those systems. So if we can become the neo-indigenous and how we bring these stories to life in sufficient systems context, they're not dated by next week um, and show that this is deep indigenous wisdom connected to consciousness, connected to science, connected to current politics, mm. connected to trends and this is why it matters then we've got an education system. Mm -hmm. The song lines are really hard for non-Aborigines to understand for lots of different reasons. I'm reading Sand Talk right now, which is helping giving me an angle on it. Um, one of the things that, sa that, that um, song lines include is um, sort of property rights, access rights, privileges. They, they include like rules of, of how things work around this bend and toward that rock that used to be the lizard that created the world. Yes. Um, things like yes. that are just embedded in the stories that are repeated and told. Um, so it's probably it's, just worth, probably worth adding one quick thing there, Jerry. Yeah. The the honouring uh, country 
uh, when you come into uh, another person's country and you honour the fact that we're we're on uh, you know uh, Nungamburra land, is to say that while we are here, we respect that you are the knowledge holders because you are the systems agents, the systems architects, and the systems understanders and meaning makers for this place. We have generic stories which we know apply to how the creator and creator spirits uh, created these landscapes, but you have the detailed understanding. And while we're here, we will honour your taboos, we will honour your uh, governance rules, you know, within our generic universal set of governance rules. And that's my understanding of how this works. So the language map was a systems map, and the systems mm. map was related to real social ecological systems. And so the respect when you walked across that boundary was because your survival and their survival and the environment's survival depended on you all respecting each other in that place. And that, that is beautiful. One of the challenges we have these days, of course, is uh, multiple waves of immigration, loss of cultural history, loss of connection with country, and now dias diaspora living in units rather than anywhere near land and completely cut off from the mechanisms of science and or observation. And so how do we bring that deep connection back unless we can actually tap into some of these deeper stories. And I think do you, one thing do we do. do we know if these song lines evolved over time or were they established and then sort of held? Again, I'm not an expert on this, uh, but I'll, I'll have a shot. My understanding is that there are stories, for example, of sea level rise in Australia and because the sea was rising, covering about 100 metres horizontally each year, uh, around the Great Barrier Reef region, for example. So there are stories about lands that are now underwater. So we know that uh, there are old stories which relate back to creation times and things that have been observed over deep time, from our, our perspective, deep time, you know, 40, 60,000 years. At the same time, uh, I imagine that, as I said before, like a minister preaching to the uh, converted, that from a te an old text, but in current systems context, um, and there's, a, there's another component here, which is that there was a vertical integration of the teaching process, uh, but it was a different level of knowledge custodian to whom the question was referred. So you advanced in your education by asking the right question, not knowing the right answer. So a youngster could be telling the story, but they're telling it around a campfire with the elders and the youngsters. And the oral history is kept true by having to respect the old story in front of the elders and get it right. And so there was a deep connection to uh, historical uh, truth, as in the word or in the beginning there was the story and systems context. And I'm sure that would be tweaked over time to take account of uh, shifts in the system by smart, more conscious operators. As a tiny example, um, in Sand Talk, uh, Tyson talks about a young Aboriginal <coughs> boy who memorized pi to some 200 or 300 digits because he was gifted in math and memory. <clears throat> but his act of doing that showed the elders that he was ready to, to sort of receive the next level uh, uh, of whatever it was they had to give him. So, so there was this, this conversation uh, set of interactions that led to increased learning. Uh, Judy? I just wanted to jump on the deep questioning aspect across multi-generational thinking. And I'd, I'd like to think actually we could bring the parents in in the middle so that people see situations from different viewpoints because that's another wisdom piece of re-examining something in your history or re-envisioning the future from different viewpoints. Um, but I just, this is such an exciting topic. I'm just kind of going crazy. And it's really, really topical. Like, you know, the, the naming of monuments and streets and schools and everything else after Confederate generals, for example, is a hot issue right this minute. And it's going to be a divisive issue in the electoral cycle. And uh, I think it's, it's a super interesting thing to peel apart and to look at from these sorts of perspectives. Other thoughts on I, this question? No. Uh, uh, who's jumping in? Uh, oh. An uh, Anthony, then Hari, then Hank. And Anthony just stepped away. So Hari, it's your turn. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is a bit of a, like uh, taking off from Judy's question, uh, but I just thought I would put it out because it's kind of interesting. Um, so the question basically is the way of producing knowledge, right? Or making sense in a context where you have a community with 
an intergenerational sort of uh, members, right? What is uh, like common to the, that process in uh, when you try and make sense and create contextual knowledge uh, when you have a community which doesn't have that intergenerational thing? Basically, uh, where I'm coming from is what is the process of, uh, you know, like how do you create knowledge uh, using context? And uh, of course, Judy's asking in terms of uh, the intergenerational thing, but I'm also interested in other community contexts, uh, for example, uh, in participatory democracy, for example, and so on and so forth. So, so I thought I'd put the question in as a, as a question. Love that. One of my questions is, why is democracy different from education, different from our dinnertime conversations, different from all these things? Why are these somehow weirdly separate activities, right? And if, if we're kind of doing this right, we're always nourishing uh, this this thing in common and we're expressing our opinions and making better decisions and improving things and borrowing from other cultures uh, to test and try different things. So how, how does that work? Uh, Hank. Yeah, so um, I, yeah, I think <clears throat> this, this kind of piece of the conversation has, has, sta has, uh, has some like parallels with some things that I've been thinking about. I was recently reading I think he's in a, uh, well, a, a philosopher with the last name McIntyre. I don't remember his first name right now, but basically was, was talking about how it has been become some of the dialogue in the past yeah, couple of decades has become apparent that there are um, values within the old, you know, paradigms and value systems that are uh, hmm, uh, outdated or not true or not fair. Right. Uh, and that, Therefore, those old value systems have, instead of being recontextualized to some of the points that you guys are making, have been thrown out with the wash and that what we need and that the fact that we never went back and reformed them to kind of tell the stories in, in our language, right, uh, that that is at the part of what's at the root of a lot of the issues that have been going on now, right? Um, Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, that guy. Um, thanks, Neil. I, I thought you might know. Um, so it's it just interesting because one of the things that has kind of been in my thought is like, is could one of the functions of this of this group be to rekindle that conversation, right? Because um, it sounds like we're, we're circling around these topics and little 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 gravity points uh, at, at different at different points. So I, I hope that adds to the conversation. But that's just kind of my maybe that's just my late check in. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Judy, go ahead. You're muted again. My capacity to contribute might be uh, diminished shortly. <laughs> or, or greatly amplified. Or enhanced, I'm not sure. It would be interesting. It would be wonderful if we could take this topic to the next level of deep thinking as we continue the dialogue and get lots of little different experiments going. Uh, in terms of the different communities that we're in on multi-generational and longer term thinking, uh, because I think we've got a nugget of wisdom that we could pursue. And, and because I've been gardening this mind map for 22 years, I'm just aching to have a conversations like these with anyone else who is <laughs> curating a body of work in some way. Like, like I just want to smush what I've crafted against other people's crafted ideas expressed in any form at all. Like, like I am just dying for that. So I'm wondering what do those experiments look like if we encourage people to come in and map, link, connect, and you know, we're, we're sharing a whole bunch of really interesting links in the chat here on the side. Um, I'm gonna, the ones that are not already in my brain, I'm gonna curate into my brain, <clears throat> but, but it's just me and my brain, it's kind of lonely in there. Susan Stuckey brought some of this up in another conversation I was in, and I think she'd be a, another person to really loop into that dendritic growth that you're talking about, Jerry. Agreed. Uh, Nancy, hey. do you want to talk about smoothification? Uh, well, no, I, 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 I hear you. I see you. I hear you. Um, I, feel, I feel so so heard and validated. Um, <laughs> and, and so that there's, the, and so there's those who think in the, you know, the kind of finding and seeking and connecting and 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 then and how does that work? And then on the periphery, there's a bunch of us who dip in and out and use that and do it. We're not particularly either adept or interested in 
this part of it because that's not how our brains or lives or contexts suggest. But where we take, oh, let me go try that. Let me bring this back. Let me go try this and bring this back. And, and for me, just listening to this conversation, I'm trying to imagine what that looks like in practice. So um, it beca because I, I, I keep on getting filled up here and I, I need to go back and try this, okay? I can't keep getting filled up without trying. So this kind of goes back to your question about where the conversations happen. So my perception at this point is this conversation is for the smushification of not just different structures that are capturing, but also the, those little, you know, the ants that are the bees, that are whatever metaphor you want to use that are going out and in. And then like, you know, right now there was enough people here who said something about how do we change education by changing what we do this fall when schools are, are not in face to face. I want to go off with that group and go do something. I want to yeah. do it tomorrow because uh, I have to. And I'm willing to commit to bringing it back into the smushification hive. Um, so so I, 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 I'm struggling to, to visualize this and I keep on getting stuck on my short headphone cord. <laughs> <coughs> Love that. Count me in. <laughs> so you just triggered a bunch of things I'm gonna try to say really quickly. First, scrolling back a little bit, I've changed my Zoom name in a way that I was asked to do when I joined a, a, a multiple conversations with uh, Native Americans. Uh, so, you know, I'm on Multnomah lands here in Portland, and it was a really nice thing. And Ken did the same on Miwok uh, lands, and do it if you want to. But, but I think that a, a piece of ritual we could start including in, uh, in OGM things, it, since we have these weird, unique, multinational, uh, multi-time zone Zoom calls, is to, to honor where we are in some way and to, and to bring that into the thing. Um, second, I think of my, my favorite, I, I use a lot of eco analogies to talk about OGM. And one of my favorites is that we are leaf cutter ants. And I've said this before, but leaf cutter ants don't eat leaves. They can't digest leaves. They bring the leaves into the nest where a subset of those ants mulches them up with spit, <clears throat> puts them on a large fungus, <clears throat> which they are symbiotic with. And this fungus's health is really important. So it's really cool. If you take a microscope and you look at the back of the little ants that are at the, at the face of the fungus, they're coated in white powder. That powder is a bacterial, it's an antifungal, antibacterial. It's to protect the fungus that they're all growing. So there's all these colonies of different sorts of things that are working together. And if we do our job right, it's like Wikipedia participation in that <clears throat> a few people gardening, curating in different tools get used by everybody else. So when I'm, when I'm in front of an audience, I ask, Who's, who has touched the Wikipedia in the last month in any way at all? You visited a page, you read something, and everybody, like 99% of the people hold their hands up. And then I say, who has made a change in the Wikipedia? And almost nobody holds their hands up. I'm, if I'm lucky, one or two people will. Um, and that's great. That's a, that's a perfectly fine participation balance because everybody else got the benefits of that work, right? So, I, so I, don't, I don't think we all need to be out mind mapping. I think a bunch of us need to be out grabbing a piece of the map, going out and doing something with it, and then bringing back what, back what worked and what didn't work so that the mappers, curators, whatever we call these roles later on, can make the map better and, and turn things around so that they're just more useful to everybody outside and then tell those stories so that anybody who's browsing by can filter into the story and just see how that, how that all works. <clears throat> and then the last thing I, I wrote to remind myself, I own the domain learn with a three in it and .com was taken, so I got .net. So learn.net has a couple things on it you'll see. Um, it's a Google site, which means it's super easy for me to give somebody access to go riff on it. And I haven't done anything with it during lockdown. And it was one of my Nancy-like moments where I wanted to go, damn, I should just grab learn.net, find a couple of people who are interested in fleshing it out for how do we change education? How do we, how do we build scaffolding for self-directed self education in the middle of this pandemic? And so we have at least that site and probably some more um, as well if we want to go use them. Sorry, that was a whole bunch of things at once. Uh, Neil. Just picking up on what Nancy said, loved it. And thanks, Jerry, for your recap. Um, the challenge, I think, is that there's a group like this, and looking at the demographic, and you know, no, uh, no insults intended. Um, how do we become attractive, right? And so, what does the strange attractor look like? And that's the reason I'm playing with the poetry and the pictures to say, you got, you came here looking for pictures, or you came here looking for poetry, but you've been surprised to also find, uh, you know, this and this and this and this and this. 
And so that's one element. Secondly, uh, in analogies, we're, we're playing with the crow's nest analogy, the crow's nest on, on the ship. You're not directing the ship, but you're warning the ship about the reefs that you can see from a higher perspective. And you're showing where you think is the best path, but you can't actually steer the ship from there. So you need context-based leadership crews that can do various bits and pieces. And the third part of this is sort of islands of sanity. You know, what does an island of sanity look like in a sea of destruction? Um, and what, do, is, what does a virtual island of sanity look like where a group like this comes together within our bubble to discuss things at a high level? And what does it look like when we go and trial that on the ground, as Nancy was saying? And every rural town can be an island of sanity with a different model. And nature works that way. Uh, it's the pre-adaptation to impending environmental change which makes it more sustainable than the alternatives. It's not necessarily just adaptation to the change as it happens. So how do we diversify the range of options and how does somebody at the crow's nest say, well, let's send a scout boat out that way, one that way, one that way, and one that way. And this is, this is the provisions we'll give to this one, this one, this one. How do we monitor that? And then it comes back to that link that I think Hari was talking about, the exercise, the insights, the feedback loop, the improvement of the brain, you know, so we'll get a better map, better map, better map, but not everybody has to see the whole map, right? And not everybody has to see uh, all the inner workings of how the map is generated, but they do need to trust the elders who are holding the map or the people that are out scouting to come back with honest information to improve the map. And that's how we improve maps. I just want us all to go into silence for just a moment to absorb what you just said, Neil, because it was beautiful and it, it triggered lots of things for many of us. So let's just hold that for a second. Just jump, oh, just jump back in. Did I miss something? Please, go ahead. Uh, oh, no, so, I was just saying hi. I had to run off and see if I had to go. Oh, that's and I hilarious. didn't, so I came back. Are you guys we, having another call? We were just having a little moment of silence. Um, uh, Neil, Neil had said something really interesting. That, that's hilarious. But I was just about to bring us out. <clears throat> and I was about to add a, a, a side note. I love the navigation, I mean, the, the Polynesian navigators that Pete put in the chat, the, all of these metaphors are work just really, they're full of energy and vitality, I think, for our conversation. A tiny thing, there's a book, I think, by John Keegan about the age of sail. Um, and he, at the very beginning of the book, he talks about how, like, everything was made of wood and smelled like wood. And it, it pitch, tar was how you sealed the wood, uh, ropes, you know, uh, all, all these sorts of things. And you could sail forever. You, you, you didn't need to refuel because you had wind. You needed to stop and get some fresh water and food and whatever. You need to resupply. But you could just keep going forever. Um, and uh, then there's a different book about lifeboats where the, the knowledge of navigation was key until the steamship. <clears throat> and then after the steamship arrives, because a steamship's like a, like a bus on the water. You can drive it any place. Um, the, average sail, the average person on board knows much less about the currents and, uh, and the winds, uh, and therefore shipwrecks are much more dangerous. <clears throat> so if you're in trouble before the steamship, kind of anybody knew, oh, we sh you know, I know we just passed an island. We should not try to get to that island. We should just sit on the current and keep going because down that away, three days is, is, is landfall and we'll never make it to the island if we try. But nobody knew that afterwards. So, so there's like knowledge and there's the technology change and all these things are, I think are, are super interesting in, in our process as we do this. We have reached the top of one hour and these calls are intended officially to be an hour long so we don't go too long. I hang out afterwards so feel free to stay in but do not have any qualms about dropping out to go uh, to a different meeting. And uh, Ken. Thank you. Neil, drink some more beer. Um, <laughs> one of the things that you that you touched uh, a bunch of sparks in my mind for, uh, when you were speaking there was about eldering. Um, so you know, a lot of people think that that eldering comes automatically with gray hair, and it doesn't. 
And a lot of people think you have to have gray hair or, or no hair. Uh, a lot of people think you have to have gray hair in order to be an elder and that it doesn't. I look at um, uh, Greta Thunberg as an example of an elder. I mean, this is, you know, Bucky Fuller used to say, you have to respect your children because they're your elders in universe time. They've soaked more up before they came into the world, right? And so a uh, really interesting question for me is, how do we recognize and honor our elders at, in every generation from the youngest to the oldest? I think that would be a really fun thing to explore here. Um, and I, I once heard a, uh, I was at a conference in uh, National Geographic, a woman who works for National Geographic uh, who studied the Polynesian um, sailors was talking about not just their ability to navigate, but um, she was on board a ship with this uh, very old man who was going back to an island and the seas were really rough and he chanted them down so that three days later when they arrived the, they could actually dock because the, the waters have been too rough that's another lost piece of our um, ability to be in contact with nature that there are people out there who know how to actually chant down the water and calm it down and likewise she told the story of women growing up in hawaii of these these older hawaiian women who would, with their long skirts, wander out into the water singing. And the fish would come to them and they would just lift their skirt up and pull the fish out of the water. And, you know, we think this is fantasy stuff, but it is very real. These were people who were so in touch with the, the world that they had, uh, they spoke a language that has been lost to us. So, you know, I'm really interested in, in that kind of stuff too, because I, I don't believe this is fantasy. I really think this is true. So. And the, my, my sad view of, of history, human history, is that we systematically went around the world and crushed this kind of wisdom and called it heresy and tried to stamp it out into the ground, salt the earth, and make sure that it never rose again. And through a lot of struggle, cultures managed to keep a lot of that wisdom alive. And um, we're at a moment now where we can go respect it. And, and we're at this really weird moment in OGM's conversation where um, how do we use techno tools, which is a lot of our fascination, to appropriately approach cultures that are much richer than techno tools that express themselves in different ways, that have understandings that are embedded in language, culture, ritual, and place and earth, which we don't have here. We've got Zoom, little rectangles of Zoom we're trapped in, like the Partridge family or Hollywood Squares. Um, exactly. I feel like we should all do like a, a Zoom call where, where we try to push out of our boxes. So how do we do that well, I think is, a, is a, 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 an important question for us to, to ponder. Um, who would like to jump in? Matt. I think I want to, I, I think I want to come back to maybe an earlier question. And Nancy, you took, a, you took a run at this as well, which is just to name that Thursday's calls are um, an opportunity for us to just, you know, share, connect, see what sparks in any one of us. Um, and then it's our, I think our, almost in, in, from the anarchist handbook, you, you almost need to say, hey, I'm going to go here and who wants to join me? And if people show up, they show up. Um, and then we, we also then need the mechanisms for bringing back, bringing back or documenting and, and cycling back some of these, you know, some of these things. And I've been really impressed with sort of the energy and the expansion of this group. I mean, the number of new people on this call today, for me, that I haven't seen are, you know, it's almost half, right? Um, and I think that's great. And, um, but I do think we need to establish in some ways, just like the song line, some meta, some meta rules, some meta philosophies that allow us to not just stay at this altitude of conversation, but but to start to to build this neo indigenousness that we maybe are talking about, right? Um, as well as tapping into kind of these older older song song language. And so, um, I don't know if we can all commit to just acknowledging what this call is, um, so that we don't get frustrated with it. That we start to acknowledge what um, what the um, sort of the um, the listserv is, and we don't get frustrated with it. So, because I think until we, until we name these things, what we're gonna find are people move in and out 
of these conversations and they either, you know, gain momentum or lose interest. Um, and I think we need to, we need to start to put some of the requisite structures in place. Um, and maybe that's a, a room in and of itself, right? Um, is, is sort of starting to propose and name those, you know, name those things so that this memory doesn't get lost, right? It doesn't just re get recorded and end up on some, you know, some ether, right? Um, so those are, that's where I'm at right now. I'd like to riff on that because it's essentially what Lauren did already with the one group. And a lot of this fits with what Lauren and I've been talking about as well. But I think we have the chance to be sort of dendritic spark points for lots of different thoughts. And if we can figure out how to capture that and share that wisdom, and engage more people, it becomes a groundswell of knowledge and information and community, which is exactly where I'd like to see this go. So I don't know how we address the challenges, but sign me up. <laughs> So part, partly I think uh, ecology is a good metaphor here and we've been talking about ecological things, but in some sense we're kind of following the energy gradient as I put in the chat, by which I mean finding where anything has energy with us. So clearly like anything around education during lockdown and rethinking education and th there were a bunch of sparks flying in the conversation when we talked about that, awesome. Somebody say, and then I put in the chat a little bit earlier, let, let's make a movie, which I think was let's put on a show uh, which is what Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland would say in half of their movies they shot together, uh, and which would then turn into a mini, a mini musical or something in the middle of a movie, which is very entertaining when you're in the Great Depression, um, but, but is also a really nice instinct. Like, okay, great, somebody has an idea. I'm gonna go, the, the invite of I'm going to go do X, would anybody like to join is something I'd love to see, you know, floated on the, on the OGM uh, list. And then, um, then to go follow the gradient into the, where there's energy and find communities that could use these things or uh, a project that we're working on that could use this kind of energy and then bring sort of a trail back to the, the hive, back to the, the termite mound uh, of what we did and where it is so that people can follow it and go find, you know, uh, go find the activity. Um, so I think, I think a, a process like that would work great. I, I'm interested in what everybody feels about how structured should it be? What do we call it? That, well, the questions Matt just asked. Lauren, the floor is yours. Well, um, Charles and I, in our organization, PicoLab, we're kind of developing a lot of ideas around um, how we actually do that and kind of the structures and the forms um, to do that. And our, our latest uh, project is hash bins. And that is kind of um, uh, creating a kind of a marketplace or resource list around ideas. So a, a hashtag is like an idea. And a hash bin makes it kind of 3D where you can connect resources and governance to an idea. And so this hash bin is a conceptual framework, which means that you can build all kinds of technology around it, but you can just do it with, you know, post-its and stuff like that. Um, but we can actually use these hash bins to work on several different projects together, but we can share a lot of different things like um, governance and uh, procedural templates to make all of this like um, really zippy and start um, accelerating kind of exponentially in terms of uh, intelligence that we share. Mm -hmm. It does sound like the place where you store your drugs, but um, <laughs> ha have you guys written this up any place or recorded it or like uh, we'd love to like anything you can send us that's that's the start of these ideas that we can absorb and- We're in, and we're in the do. process, we actually wanna just make them Okay. So we can just show you a hash bin. <laughs> um, yes, I didn't think of that, but that's like a very pleasant sound. <laughs> first, first, thing, first thing I thought is like, hmm. And the Aboriginal peace pipe. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, no, I did ask a question. On, on Monday, okay. I asked a question in the, in the chat, but um, we'll come around. So Lauren, did you, did you sort of underscore this, the, the Monday thing or I don't, I don't mean to. I did to, mention to, it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're, uh, again, we're, we're hosting a Monday call. And so we're talking about just interesting subjects right now. We're just talking about race. I'm trying to get it more diverse each time. 
and kind of scale up the conversation pretty quickly and um, divide people into rooms where they can talk about, um, basically each room has their own hash bin and they're talking about an idea and they're building out that uh, hash bin and actually manufacturing memes. So memes involve not just thinking up ideas, but figuring out how you're gonna get those ideas in other people's heads, which is an entirely different thing. <laughs> Um, and it, there's, when you were talking earlier about meme generation, I was busy having a thought about the difference between memes and, con and like a deep context. <clears throat> and, and I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had there because, because I appreciate memes and I know a couple of friends who are like, memes are dead, forget memes. But, but the contagious idea that is like briefly uh, encapsulated and, and like everybody forwards because, right? That's sort of a, a meme. Um, are almost the opposite of the deep context and the storytelling and the, 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 the rich things that memes live inside of, to me. I, I, like to me, a meme is a, tin, a tiny little nugget that may or may not be real, that catches people's imagination and, and, and no, like- No, because I think memes are beyond these little like animated gifs that we, that's what we associate them with, but they're really right. ideas that spread. Um, yes. So one of the reasons some of us love pattern languages, for example, mm -hmm. is that a good pattern language creates named patterns that, are, that become memes. So light from two sides from a pattern language, the original pattern language book is a meme, is a thing among people who know it. Um, and and so, I, I, so that's a deep meme for me. Um, but I think that meme has become, you know, the Pepe the Frog gif that's moving the alt-right forward because it gets forwarded across all of media and then becomes part of the conversation and then shifts our conversation in the wrong direction. So I'm really interested in the role of memes and what you're thinking. I actually wonder though, if, um, if memes aren't a portion of a story, right? Um, not so much like an encapsulated story in and of itself, but uh, a meme really can't exist without the existing framework of a story out there. Memes right? are that... the rest of the context, yeah. Exactly. So wh whether or not that story is true or it's fiction, it's, that's mostly immaterial to the meme itself. Um, and so when you, when you reframe the concept of a meme to just be a, a small portion of a story, a, another vector in which to tell a story, um, then how does that change how you feel about memes? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm suddenly picturing memes as being like the little uh, lift point when, you, when you're sitting on the plane and you look out at the engine and it says hoist point or something like that. That's mm -hmm. the place where that's the place where you hook on to the engine to lift it off the plane, but it, but it's a place of engagement with a much larger object, right? And and so maybe a meme because a good meme is actually triggering several different contexts in our heads. Uh, maybe that that's a, a a more functional, more useful way to look I at think, it. Jerry, to me, it's like when you think about memes and like actually, um, I, I I know this is like uh, I'm not supposed to say this in kind of a liberal setting. But when you're actually like making your own kind of propaganda and getting into the fray, it's, it, it brings you beyond, say for example, there's like the idea of institutional racism. That's an idea, it's been around for like 30 or 40 years. But if people don't understand, it hasn't like escaped from academia, it's not in people's heads. So it takes you beyond like, what you want to self-express and these like deep academic ideas and gets you thinking who's the target audience and how do we actually build out this idea so that it like it's it can we can get it in there like a missile <laughs> like, um you know and like, like how uh, like when we discovered that when we're having conversations about race, um, there's certain, there's people have hundreds of thousands of programmed messages and deep reactions around certain topics. So if you say if you say certain keywords, people will have an automatic response that's not even it's programmed. So you have to like go kind of under that language. And um, 
and get in there in a way that people don't expect that they don't have mm -hmm. um, guards up against already. We could, we could just do what they did in the matrix and just inject a bug into you through your umbilical cord. <laughs> <clears throat> that, that, that seems to work. Uh, Matt. I mean, I, th there's, there's a couple of things here. One is I put a, a link to a video to Doris Summers. Um, she also wrote a book. Um, it is the work of art in the world and, you know, art as a pathway into some of these larger narratives. And I think this has been the role of artists, uh, um, uh, you know, in, in the world uh, in terms of creating change, right? Um, and you could even see really good memes as almost being their own sort of social commentary art pieces and, and, and things of that nature. I think the other thing that I would, um, you know, I'm reminded of is a conver you know, conversations I've been having with Kenneth um, Tyler and also uh, Pete, our conversation that we had around that the system itself is, it, that agents, our own agency is maybe um, less than we believe it to be and that the system itself is what dictates our thoughts and our behaviors and, and where we come from. And, you know, I wonder about the, um, I wonder about the sense-making process, which is understanding and maybe becoming aware of, um, you know, your, where you are in this system. But I'm also wondering about sense-breaking and what are the, you know, what are the techniques that allow for, you know, multiple paradigms to start to, to, to crash into each other and, and, and then start to break down, you know, break down these things. And so um, maybe Jay, just, can you, can you maybe share just a little bit more about, you know, the thoughts on stories as metaphors, as mythologies that then, you know, either reinforce those paradigms or break those paradigms. And um, I don't know where that goes, Lauren, because maybe I'll just finish by saying, and I know I'm kind of moving around in a couple of different places, but um, I feel like we've been here before, not we being us, but we being humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and that these tools and these techniques and all the things we're talking about are, I mean, these things have been mastered in various forms in various places. And yet we're, we're still sitting here advocating for the creation of things that have been created. And how do we move beyond that into just organizing these tools against a common aim, which is, um, you know, uniting collective thought against, um, against the major problems that face us as a, as a civilization. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and, and sort of relinquish the floor. Did you make that up, sense breaking, or did you read that? In well, along? sense breaking, sense breaking, it was referenced in um, uh, Anne, and I can't remember Anne's uh, um, last name, but she's the architect who was on one of the earlier Anne calls. Anne Pendleton Julian. Yeah, and so in her book, um, you know, she was talking about, uh, kind of talking about this linear, and I'll try to find the um, uh, the artifact, but. Um, uh, the imagination is the thing that is required for sense breaking mm -hmm. um, and moving into that space is important, right? Jay, did you want to riff on that? Yeah, Jay and then Neil. Yeah, so thank you. Um, we look at our lifetime, our entire lifetime and the question of what is it that we remember, right? What, what, what do we still hold from an entire lifetime? And that's a big exercise, right? It's, some do it in memoir, but like just today, if we were to try to look back on our entire life, um, largely, and it's not entirely, but largely it would be these stories and they might be small stories, they might be little nuggets. Some of them might be insights, just things that we learned. Um, let's say that if we're gonna, it's 80-20, 80% 80, 80 are stories, 20% are little nuggets or insights, which we might, linked to memes actually, kind of little nuggets and bits of insight that traveled through our lives. If we look at the collective, we know it's a standard establishment that culture is carried by story, but kind of again, bottom up, maybe it's more like insight, well, bottom up. So just a kind of parallel thought since we're talking about it today, song lines being a kind of collective cultural um, foundational earth story coming up. Maybe it's 
song lines, building up to story, building up to meme or things that are kind of put out. And so just a, just a riff on this, but I think the question, the way that I try to approach it is to try to come back to what is the elemental component that carries memory and informs insight from one lifetime and from collective lifetime. So if we can get a handle on what a basic form of that is, a basic media of that is, maybe it is the in between of the song line and the kind of viral insight or meme. Um, Neil, and then I'd like to step in. Go ahead, Neil. Beautiful, thanks, Jay. Just picking up on a couple of things here. Um, memes, uh, I think it was, Matt was talking about art. I've been talking about poetry and pictures. Um, Ken is a master of puns. Humor and cartoons are engagement points. The trick is in sense making and sense breaking. It either makes sense or it breaks sense in the eye of the beholder. And in the eye of the beholder, it generates cognitive dissonance. And so at that moment of cognitive dissonance, they're now asking a question, not knowing the answer. How did you get that from that? How did you see that so deeply? How did you express that so simply? How did you capture my heart about what's happening in the world? And in that cognitive dissonance, in that moment of changing the interpretation of what was up until then a previously sacrosanct chunk, this is what I think when I see that. And I think this is part of the dynamic that Ken and I play with in dancing around puns, that in bringing in a completely separate uh, interpretation just for fun around something which other people have already taken as for granted, it changes the conversation in real time. And court jesters were specifically chosen to do this for the king, right? And they, they, their life was on the line. If they got it wrong, they were executed. If they skirted the line between truth and potential alternative truth, and the king could choose, when the king chose the, the, the message that the jester had been given, the jester was elevated. Um, and the, but the crowd was always in awe. Is he going to lose his head for going too far this time? but the king was the one who was seen as the wise one for having decided whether this was real or not and chosen which truth to believe or not. And the and jesters so, were, were given a lot of license. The jesters had a lot of room to try stuff until they were beheaded, but, but they had exactly. a lot of license. <laughs> right up until the edge. And they're dancing right on that edge between interpretation and gently suggesting to the king, how might you choose to take this to speak truth to power in front of an audience in a way that changed the story, right? And that is the challenge that I have to face because I'm trying to do that too. How do I attract people that wouldn't otherwise be listening to a 60 year old white guy to come into the room and learn something they wouldn't have otherwise heard, right? And that requires, in Peggy Holman's words, disrupting coherence compassionately and you know, then recohering wisely. But you've got to get the system to see itself in cognitive dissonance and then give them permission and tools to recohere more wisely with a different level of consciousness about that particular issue or that particular thing. And I think that is the magic here that we're dancing with is we've got this information in multiple silos. We've got all these pieces. We can see multiple connections. But if you look at it, you'll see this. If you look at it, you'll see that. But what if we both looked at it and said, well, from my perspective, it, it's an elephant. <laughs> and so, oh, I didn't see the elephant. And you see these little things on, on Facebook with, do you see the faces or the animals first, you know, those sorts of things. And it takes people some time to go crunch, crunch, crunch. And the simplistic perspective is, oh, there's two ways to see this. The deeper perspective is the psyche, the, 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 the worldview that caused you to think like that. And when you reflect on that, then you get, really deep insights because people go, oh, until now I've only ever seen it that way. And that's where change happens. Let me, um, let me go ahead, Kurt. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just about to follow up really quickly on something that Matt said earlier about um, how he feels as if we have been here before. Um, and I would argue that you're correct. And um, I think a decent analogy to me is um, I, I think we've been changing the mediums in which we tell stories. And anytime you change the medium in which you tell a story, stories need to get retold. Um, 
So from just one layman's perspective, um, I always repurchase my five favorite albums on whatever new media comes out, right? Um, it went from cassette buying Tribe Call Quest to CDs buying Tribe Call Quest to mini discs, if anybody remembers those. <laughs> See, like, and so it's, it's kind of the same thing. See, that's exactly it. Like, we always um, end up retelling the stories that we want, that we love, that we think are important in whatever new medium comes out. Unfortunately, if we take that up to a civilization level of scale, um, it, it means that only the stories that we feel are truly, truly important as a society will survive. Not just the ones that are, you know, well, our well, favorites. I, I find that the stories that will control a society are the ones that survive on the surface. And the ones that are good for society to, for our continued existence are the ones that are pushed under and survive because they're so strong that they live through cultural genocide, basically. But, but the ones that are on the surface are really often stories that people want us to believe, like uh, time is money and unless people are starving, they won't work. Those are stories that we're told. And they're mm -hmm. part of the controlling narrative that we're trying to overthrow by replacing it with other little mind worms. Uh, that will actually run us in a much more generative civilizational kind of way. Um, so I mixed on that. Uh, let me mm -hmm. go to Judy and then um, I'd like to throw three things in quickly and then Charles and Ken. So Judy? Just wanted to highlight the, the jester as the sage imaging and yeah. how we use that in terms of the storytelling and um, sort of breaking iconography and moving in all of those just directions because that's a powerful concept. Cool, thank you. Um, a couple of things I've been putting in the chat I wanted to explain. Um, one is the five minute university because as I see this list of books and things to read and do, every time I'm like, holy crap, how, who, you know, I have way too many tabs open in my browser right now, most of which are substantive pieces that I know are going to help click things in place for me. <clears throat> but if we were to synthesize these for one another and place them into our emerging medium, um, that would help reduce all of our reading lists. So I've done a couple, I've done I think three, Five minute you videos that are on YouTube explaining some of my favorite books and hopefully somebody can sort of absorb them and, and, and see what's up. You put um, the link, Jerry? Uh, I will put the links to those. Uh, uh, in, I'll put the link to a couple of them in the chat in a second. The second thing is my earliest, I, I put a link to one of my earliest uh, uh, videos, well not the earliest, but an old video called Narrative, uh, Nuggets, Narratives, and Points of View and I can explain it in a second. A nugget is any addressable a thing, like a tweet or a book or a web page or whatever else. A narrative strings together nuggets, like a story thread would, but a narrative strings together nuggets to tell a story. Um, so the narrative, how did we get to the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009? Or how do we get out? A narrative can also look ahead and say, how might we get out of this financial crisis or the pandemic? And then a point of view is a collection of narratives on, in some domain. And so my point of view about economics and finance might be collected in the videos I've put out there about, you know, SNP, uh, how did we get into the great financial crisis, which is not just a history, but a point of view that says we were cutting long-term relationships of trust uh, across the system in different ways. And that catalyzed us falling into this hole, which we haven't patched yet, we haven't fixed yet. So, so, so that would be one of my narratives. And then I might point to a narrative of Matt's, one of Lauren's, one of Kurt's, to assemble my point of view about finance, economics, political economics, whatever it might be. But that would be a shorthand. So if you came to me and said, what do you think? I could just say, hey, go look at these narratives uh, because, or, or these points of view that are built out of narratives, because you can easily see what I'm thinking about. And if we had super smart machine learning, maybe 10 years down the road, um, your points of view and my points of view might be more easily compared such that um, the system could say, hey, y'all seem to agree on these, you know, eight, 10 things, but your, your major disagreements appear to be over here. I've ordered some wine. Why don't you, you know, why don't you sit down and have a go at talking about these things, right? So that might be a way to do it. And then last story, um, one of my favorite stories is of a, a, a psychotherapist named Milton Erickson who had polio when he was young. He lived in the Great Depression. He was known, for, he, was, he, he used hypnosis to try to talk to people's unconscious. He was known for his handshake induction so that he would take, the, he would take advantage of the fact that when you shake somebody's hand, you enter this like limbic, limbic loop where you're just 
in a handshake until the handshake ends and your mind is sort of suspended for a little bit. So he would make it so that he would linger in the handshake. By the time he finished the handshake, whoever he was shaking hands with was in trance. And he would then try to talk to their unconscious because his whole idea was your unconscious is always trying to protect you. It's trying to do the right thing. It's seldom doing the right thing. He wanted to give the unconscious a broader vocabulary of options so that when you came up to the next bridge because you had a phobia about bridges, you wouldn't just scream in panic and, and like, you know, do whatever. You would pull over to the side and rest. You would talk yourself through it. You would whatever. And I'm always trying to figure out what, is Mil what would Milton Erickson do? What, what are the small actions? What is Wu Wei, action through least action? What are the tiny things we can do? And, and memes appeal to me in that way because memes are small and portable and viral. So what are the smallest things we can do to soften people's way of seeing the world the other part of the conversation we're having here, such that we can transform our attitudes toward one another in different ways. Yeah, what would Milton Erickson do? Exactly, Ken. So now back to Charles, then Ken, I think. And then we've already gone 90 minutes. We should start wrapping our call pretty soon. Go ahead, Charles. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I was just, I uh, wanted to, th thanks to everyone. Um, go, go back and um, Kurt, what you were sharing, and I want to tag on this thinking about replacing your, your top, you know, five albums and through the different media. And you mentioned the tribe called Quest. And I know, you know, with the, the, they're not alone in needing sort of requiring right conditions, let's say for bass and treble. And, and I just, I know, for example, when CDs came out, the mastering and, and a lot of times they were remixed, that just the sound was crap, like totally garbage. Um, and so that just came to mind, this idea of translating between these different media. They're not you know, equivalent necessarily. And then we talk about the packaging and everything else, but I'm just dealing with the sound and I'm also a sound guy. Um, it's kind of a big topic, but just to drop that in, you know, this idea of like equivalent content, content but it doesn't really translate directly, especially the nonverbal stuff when we're talking about sound. And then just the last thing is, is um, kind of different systems um, between recording and producing and then transmitting and receiving. So that comes to how we listen, this, the circumstance, what mood we're in, and, and everything else through the, the whole chain of, of, of sound and experience. Thanks. You're 100% right, actually. One of the interesting things is that I, I listen to jazz, um, old, old school jazz uh, on record primarily, because at the time, that was the medium in which they were willing to share their music with us, right? So they, they sang and they played for it assuming that it would hopefully eventually get to that medium. Um, and so translating that to CD is tough. You don't actually get the original soul of what they were trying to do. Um, I'm working on a project right now with my aunt who's working on, um, uh, my aunt's a storyteller. Um, she's working on um, uh, the, the history of, uh, the history and the life of Malcolm X's mother. Um, and one of the things that she's uh, that she and I are kind of grappling with right now is how do we tell Mal the story of Malcolm X's mother using the new media of today, given the fact that her life was very much lived in, you know, yesterday. Um, and so this is one of those things that I think just from a historical perspective, um, we have to be conscious of what mediums in which we tell stories just because of the context in which lives were lived. And I don't know the answer to any of that question yet. And the, the medium really affects the story, really affects everything. Like there's, there's this gigantic effect from, you know, if, you, if you're trying to retell that story in TikTok, it's going to be a very different story, yep. right? It's going to be a very different story, but the story might reach many more people that otherwise wouldn't have found. And, and can we use a TikTok nugget a meme of it to bring people to a different version of it in a different medium that somehow works better. Um, yeah. Ken? So my favorite TikTok artist right now is Sarah Cooper, who spends seven or eight hours to do a 45 second TikTok. You know, she's the woman who um, mimes. Lip, lip syncs Trump. To Trump. Um, which brings me to my point about, uh, as I'm listening to all this, you know, I'm all about the body. I'm about somatic intelligence. This is, this is the stuff that I, I really like to play around with. And if we're going to be changing stories and telling stories that are, are sense breaking, 
we've got to develop the bodies to be able to stay in those stories when they arise. Um, some work I did with, with uh, a couple of colleagues a few years ago after Ferguson was we didn't want to have a conversation about race and talk about race. We wanted to have a conversation where people listened to race because most people don't have a body that as soon as the topic of racism comes up, they get defensive, they leave, they get violent, they just can't even stand it. So how, what are the, the practices and dynamics that allow us to enter into this really dangerous territory of changing stories with a body that is open and calm and centered and grounded so that when things come up, we go, wow, that's really, that challenges me on a lot of levels. Let me create a space around that where it's safe to hold it. And maybe that looks like you and I can't talk for a little bit because I can feel this charge between us, or maybe we need to dance around that charge in some way and discharge this energy, you know, but, um, this is where, for me, I think it's really, really important to be paying attention to what goes on in your body when things are challenged. And there's a wonderful book that I'm in the midst of reading right now called My Grandmother's Hands, which is a somatic approach to dealing with racism. What the person calls, um, I don't, I'm listening to the book, so I don't know the person, the author's name, but he, he talks about white body supremacy and how every single one of us is, um, traumatized and that trauma lives in white bodies differently than it lives in black bodies. And it lives in police bodies differently, regardless of whether you're white or black. And we've all got this trauma and we all have to start to calm our nervous systems down because racism is not something out there. It's something in our nervous systems. So I, that's just some things that got stirred up in this whole conversation. And, you know, I feel like we could go on for days here. I just, I, I get so nourished. This is better than any breakfast. So Thank you, guys. <laughs> Low calorie, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I'll point out what may be really obvious, but um, in Zoom conversations, I'm not threatened by anybody's physical presence because I know they can't reach out and harm me. Uh, on the other hand, in Zoom conversations, wait a minute, Ken, that hurt. Um, on the other hand, I can step away at any moment. I can shut off. I can, I can disengage much more quickly than if we were standing near each other and we're sort of engaged in those different ways. So the dynamics are really different here. And um, I'm interested in how that plays out and you know, what effects that has on the conversation. We should start wrapping our call. Anybody want to drop a couple of concluding thoughts in the conversation? Charles. It, I was just curious if there's any nano wrap up from the kind of tools map session or if there's indications where that's going uh you mean the one that gene led sorry no there was a there was gene, another one there was a gene system one. session then there was a visualization hoedown you mean the hoedown i missed the hoedown so i'm okay. kind of i called yeah. it a hoedown partly so that it would be a little bit memorable and we could refer to it as the hoedown not the not the session because i was just confused about which one you were talking about a, a moment ago so so the hoedown was actually super fun it ran almost two hours um and we got a lot of examples of tools up. It would be lovely to lather, rinse, repeat a couple times and to refine. Um, uh, although at the end I was like, how could we make this better? What else could we do? And there weren't that many suggestions to, to do it better. I think it's, it's like let's repeat it a couple times. Um, and, and I'm really interested in what happens when you give that a little more breathing room, a little more time for people to use the tools well uh, applied to a particular topic. So maybe next time we choose a topic and we give everybody lead time or or we pick a TED talk to pick something you know, kind of neutral and say, hey, everybody, use your tool on, on the content of this talk in any way you want. And then we compare notes. That would be interesting as well. Because I had picked a topic that was kind of, um, I picked a, the topic of regenerative ec economy, regenerative agriculture, which was out of, out of some people's depth. It was kind of really new material for some people, uh, slightly controversial. And um, I didn't, sound the gun when we had started the discussion we just kind of slipped into discussion so a couple of people who were using tools were like wait i missed i missed like when the go mark was uh, <laughs> but it all worked out well in the end so the, so the session was was really cool pete um real quick i think another hoedown would be a great thing i think something else uh charles asks is there like a, a nano readout and it reminds me of something judith said was i wish i had a kind of a guide to um the different kinds of tools for visualizing and things like that. I think there's an opportunity, I, I, and I would be interested in participating with a few other people to, you know, do a five-minute university basically on, on visualizing, visualization tools and things like that. 
Um, so a couple things on that. One is uh, we found somebody had written a Notion uh, spreadsheet that had a really nice long list of tools. I have in my brain a whole series of tools. I don't know that I don't know that we want to have the ambition of having the complete list of tools that have fields and and reviews and whatever else. I don't think that's that's like it's, no, it's, it's not a not a comprehensive list. It's exactly. more like you know here's here's network graphs, here's hierarchies, here's you know narrative narrative telling. Exactly. Here's, um, here's the graphic facilitation. But a couple of things we could do easily. One is we could have people who have a deep experience in any of these things just give cooks tours of the things they know best and their suggestions. That's simple to do. We could record those, post those, and then, and then link to those. That's super easy. Um, and then, um, oh, I lost the track of the thing I was going to say next. Um, oh, and then I don't know that we have a chat bot expert in the room, but I have a funny feeling it wouldn't be that hard to put a chat bot up that would let you talk through um, the various tools and group process techniques. So, so, and then the good thing about chatbot is that they're 24 seven, they're inexpensive, and you can always just keep improving the back end. It can just make the intelligence better. So maybe it wouldn't know about liberating structures now, but what if we could figure out how to implement, you know, bo different bodies of knowledge on, on this kind of thing in a chatbot so that you could say, you know, it would ask you, hey, do you want a long lasting memory of this or are you looking for a one-time event? And then that, that would sort of be a sort through the data that keeps getting richer and better at the back end, whatever that back end is. So, so I think a chatbot project would be really cool as a way of, of offering everybody um, a way of accessing all this. Yeah, and an old um, school adventure game. And uh, yeah, adventure and, game. And this way, we, and we way. could always do Zork. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I have forest, built many. A a, I've built many a chatbot in my day, by the way. So that is awesome. So you and Pete seem to have a lot of chatbot experience. That's that's terrific. Uh, Judith then Charles. Just an awesome call. Um, I always end up with more action items than I can possibly accomplish. So I think forming little groups that go off and do things and come back would be really helpful uh, just so that we don't lose the momentum that's generated in the ideation here. Love that. Yes. Charles? So exactly on that, on that topic of forming little groups, um, and there was a reference sort of much earlier to the Telegram channel that I created, I sort of like I like Telegram these days, um, can say this and that about it, and, but um, it works pretty well. So that um, maybe the chatbot conversation could, for example, go into Telegram or there could be a dedicated channel even for that, for example. And I, I think it, we're trying to wrap up, um, but my approach and my sense also with a number of other overlapping groups is, is um, a little bit the more the merrier and kind of lean into the chaos and the messiness of all that and, and not necessarily expect too much or particular things or when you want to expect and you know focus on particulars then just work them out and and that's okay too um and not not necessarily to have you know like the written report from the from the the hoedown thing but but if you know if there's something quick to share in 20 seconds and you know like that so love that I guess find Thank me you. on telegram and we can we can spin out more channels perhaps or I also happen to like slack but now I don't want to open a whole can of worms here but yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you Anthony I think you might have the last word here yeah uh, the, uh, the people was talking about our various my, I'm just trying to summarize nuggets narratives points of view stories epics themes etc that's uh, is, is that kind of like what largely what you, what's been talked about here is using those devices to capture and store knowledge for future generations is is that kind of a I think we've gone really broad and wide every call and every like we're turning over a lot of soil so those are important markers you've just hit but if I scroll back in my memory through the calls we've been having so far we've done a whole lot of other digging would anybody like to offer other other landmarks that stick out for you because that is the territory. It's, it's I mean, the, the general umbrella is how do we make better collective decisions? That, that's kind of a starting point. Uh, one of my assumptions or beliefs is that we have a really crappy collective memory because we're being flooded by, by information and we have no tools to make and share memory. Uh, and I have this weird experience of 22 years curating one mind map, which most people don't have. Uh, but that has given me these insights about, hey, damn, if you've got context you can trust, and that you can always look into and, and draw from that changes how you interact in conversation. Um, and I want this to be available to more people the way Wikipedia is available to more people. So that's another sort of motivating thing. So 
and then there's another belief, which is that uh, emotion and membership trump reason most of the time. So even though I'd love to build beautiful uh, uh, edifices of logic and convince people of stuff logically, I know that that ain't going to work most of the time. And therefore, we must reach into the heart. We must reach into the gut. We must actually connect somatically, physically. We must break bread together. We must walk into each other's places and feel vulnerable. Um, those things are all completely necessary to this. So, so all of those things feed uh, this conversation. Uh, go ahead, Neil. And just to weave a little bit back into the indigenous here, a uh, structure I was playing with some years ago, uh, data in context is information, information in context is knowledge, knowledge in context is wisdom, of course there's different interpretations of spiritual wisdom, is wisdom in deep systems context indigenous knowledge? And so you know, the, the question for me is, you know, if, if this is going to be meaningful data, how does it fit? So the sense making is, does this bit fit? And if not, what do I have to change in the data or, or the map? Uh, and if I haven't got systems context, how do I grok that? So I think indigenous wisdom has that beautiful connection with the systemic and the systematic expressed and embodied through the dance song lines and so on, which brings it back to the, how do we embody and feel, not just see and observe what it is that's going on around us. And mm -hmm. you can hear the bells tolling in the background, so I better mute. But thanks That's so much great. for a great call, everybody. Love the bells. Uh, and let me take us out with, with a thought, with a riff on what Neil just said, um, which is um, you've seen on the list that we can get pretty philosophical. And in fact, I think there are kind of endless, fruitful, philosophical conversations about all the things that we're touching. Uh, and one of them, for example, is just about data. And a friend of mine, Tom Monike, helped build uh, the VISTA system, which is the basis of the VA's hospital information systems. And he goes really deep on data philosophy and early on convinced me that a data field cannot capture what a nurse sees when he or she goes into a room and sees a patient. There is no way those fields are going to work. Can't have enough fields. The gray skills don't work because the nurse notices, wow, they seemed ashen and their breath was a little shallow. And that was a little bit worse than last time I was here. So let's call the doctor in, right? And, and so, yes, and, and I'm a, one of my mentors, Russ Acuff, may have been guilty of the data pyramid. He may have been one of the contributors to like data knowledge wisdom. Whenever I see that brought up, my, my little spidey sense goes up um, because it tends to, it tends to pre, it tends to emphasize data, right? And, and, and philosophically, I know that there's weaknesses around data as, as I just kind of tried to explain. So how do we experiment with all these things? How do we let these philosophical conversations go, but then take the lessons back to the hive so that we can benefit from our time together studying these things? And by the by, everybody on the intratubes has been studying these issues also. Let's synthesize what they did. Let's point to it. Let's weave it, which is partly what I do in my brain. Like, so you go into any topic uh, in, in my brain that I've cared to go look at. And I've tried, I've been trying to do exactly that, like synthesize the best of and put it together and click it in place so that somebody might go in and get a sense of what's happening. And then I try to put in my own opinions so that I can go back and, and build those and see those. And I want to do this together as a big, as a big game, serious game. Right, so that, that's kind of a, a piece of the motivation here. Um, with that, we've run a long, long time, 10 minutes short of, 12 minutes short of two hours. I thank you all enormously. This has been like the total happy, happy fest in my brain. So um, thank you all for being here. Um, see you on the mailing list and see you uh, next Thursday. And then as we break into separate sub conversations, see you in those. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful conversation. Always leaves me up for the whole day. Yeah. yeah. Hi, everybody. And what you can hear in the background here, this is Leuven, a very Catholic town. That is the call to prayer for a failing church at the top of the hill. And so wow. there are huge church assets that could be repurposed to become the Gothic cathedrals of the 21st century. You know, how do we create these islands of sanity, structure, and resilience? Um, so there's, you know, infrastructure waiting to be repurposed if we can reach the hearts. Take care. It's a great Bye. question. Thank you. Thank you so much.